Welcome. We're live, gents. Hi. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the next episode of the Wizards of the Couch. Uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. I'm joined on the couch tonight uh, by my three fellow wizards, uh, gaming veterans Casey Riff, Brian Berg, and Jimmy Duffy. We're sitting around and talking games and gaming, and we're having a couple of drinks. I'm having a cider tonight. And uh, just a warning before okay. anybody gets too deeply in, this is an adult show. We, uh, we, you know, we don't get crazy with the language, but, um, you know, don't, don't expect it to be 100% uh, child safe. And uh, feel free to have a drink along with us while you're, uh, while you're listening in. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a lot of really interesting uh, stuff going on. We're going to be talking with John Messenger, uh, an author uh, of um, a new series, well, several series, but a new series that he's got coming out. I'm going to let him talk a little bit about that. But before we get rolling, uh, I'll just say I'm Danny Grimes. I'm now T-48 from being at Gen Con and running a bunch of cool stuff. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, Matt, why don't you talk a little bit? Hi, I am Matt. I go by Casey Rift on the internets. I am the owner of Cobalt Con, owner and operator, and uh, also, I guess, organizer, lead organizer for uh, the Blackwood Society, which is organized play for independent publishers. Tonight, I am drinking... I've actually saved this. I've got another local brew. If you remember, I had uh, tossed uh, toss this. What was it? The caber toss one. T toss this, you wee lad, last week. Uh, I've got Vito Oak Aged uh, from Wallace Brewing right here in uh, right here in Idaho, Wallace, Idaho. So I'm looking forward to that. It's even numbered. Look at that. It's four fifty-seven and one thousand with with an with a wax top. It's pretty fancy. Oh, I, yeah. You can't beat it. I hope you can't beat it because it was expensive. He's not sharing with the class. So, Brian? What a jerk. He is. A jerk. Well, that's Brian is. Open. Need open. I don't know if I'll drink it myself. <laughs> Brian is the uh, director of operations around here, so I'll let him tell you a little bit about the other stuff he does. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm Brian Berg. I am the CEO, COO of uh, Wizco Games, also the director of operations over at Total Party Kill Games. Um, mostly you've probably seen me as that guy at uh, every convention you've ever gone to ever. Um, <laughs> and uh, tonight I will be drinking a delightful Colorado native amber lager which is absolutely delicious. Um, and you can only get them in Colorado. I was just there on vacation, so I thought it was very apt. So delightful. Can I may have more than one, just saying. Can you find that outside the Springs? Is that available outside the Springs? So I've only ever seen it, it there, but. I don't know. I didn't look at every single alcohol shop. What are you trying to say, Matt? <laughs> he's throwing <laughs> it tonight. I think he's, I think he's, I think he's describing something accurately with facts. Uh, and uh, Jimmy uh, Duffy uh, sits like Modoc at the center of all things technical in our world. Uh, Jimmy, tell us a little bit about what you've been up to and what you do. Hello, folks. Jimmy Duffy here, Praetors Rejects. I'm a head reject over the channel there, and uh, the. Uh, uh, IT guy here running the technical side of this within the monstrosity that it is. Uh, yeah, running games on the channel. Uh, do mostly all online and we'll be out there at Gen Con also getting bitch slapped around by Danny to do things. Uh, as we're running games, uh, I get out there Saturday, uh, Friday morning, so I'm going to miss the Thursday night festivities. I'm kind of upset, but that's just the way it is with when you work for yourself. Uh, but yeah, but, welcome everybody, uh, and uh, we're looking for some fun tonight. Quick, quick, All right, lunch, everybody. Drink up. Yes. Yeah, quick, oh, uh, having, yeah, special, special vintage of Agua de Casa de Duffy. Agua de Casa de Duffy. That sounds pretty expensive. Pretty sick. Tasty. No, I didn't go to the store. If it's if it's in a foreign <laughs> language, it's expensive. That is a tasty no. beverage. It's tasty so beverage, we, and it's lovely. <laughs> cup by this so um i want to apologize ahead of time too uh not that i need any nerd sympathy from the internets but my uh production machine here normally that i broadcast to it totally fried out this week unexpectedly so mm. i'm on i'm broadcasting on wi-fi so if things start stuttering and get weird i might have to drop out i imagine that my cohorts will uh will take up that gauntlet uh courageously and run it forward if that happens so um 
let's uh, let's welcome our our guest this evening. Uh, John Messenger is uh, is a guy that I met only recently at the last Gary Con. Um, John was, uh, I guess I'll just do a little bit of an intro, but tonight we're going to be building on a theme that we've been discussing uh, for a while now. And I think John's going to be helped to uh, illuminate that theme and, and give us some insights that none of us probably have particularly. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, when you game master, when you game master, when you build worlds, when you create these maps and imagery that we've been talking about the last few weeks, um, we haven't really delved deeply into story, like as a construct. I mean, we all agree, I think, uh, with head nods, that story is a really big part of role playing games, tabletop role playing right. games. Uh, but different people use it for different things, and different people uh, get different things out of uh, out of a story. Uh, just like different people build characters differently, draw maps differently, so on and so forth. So. Um, Tonight, we have as our guest, John Messenger. He is a writer. He's a military man. He is a D&D player. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a little background on John. Uh, he was born in London uh, back in 79. I don't want to out you too much, but uh, <laughs> with, a, with a face like John's, uh, you got to wonder if he's got like a picture somewhere that is slowly getting older while he remains eternally youthful. <laughs> um, and... Uh, he uh, graduated from USC, and uh, he has been writing science fiction while serving in the military. Uh, so he has had a couple of deployments to Iraq and done some humanitarian relief missions uh, in Haiti. But he wrote his uh, uh, Brink of Distinction uh, trilogy uh, while serving uh, deployment in Baghdad, Iraq. So I'm not necessarily certain that I would recommend that as a writer's workshop. Uh, I hear Clarion West is really good. Uh, there's some place in the Berkshires that you can get away for a couple of weeks and really, really hone your craft. Baghdad would not be my first choice, but apparently it worked for John. So welcome, John. Hey, I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, I, uh, I also don't recommend Baghdad as a writing workshop, as a retreat. Um, but I will say if you're going to write military science fiction and you want to talk about blowing stuff up, actually getting blown up really helps with that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. As a GM, do you find that your sound effects for explosions and things are, are more authentic? Oh, God, no. I'm awful at it. I'm still the guy's like... <laughs> <laughs> when your explosions sound like loud static. Yeah. <laughs> so just as kind of an icebreaker, we always start with a, with a brief kind of uh, around-the-way around the question on when did it start for you? What, what got you into gaming and what was kind of the, what's the thing that's kept you hooked? into it uh i think we were talking before the show a little bit about there's those thresholds you get a car you start to date you go to college you get married those are all places where D, &D can leave your life forever so uh you obviously made it through that gauntlet how did that happen uh so i didn't actually so uh i started playing D, &D when i was uh probably elementary school and it was mainly because of my brother my my brother's four years older than me and uh so crazy he really got into D, &D um he kind of pulled me along with it and i, and I loved it uh, I've always been a storyteller. I've always loved that imagination piece of it. And so I really got into it, had a great time. But like everyone else, right around the time I got to high school and realized that girls didn't think D&D was cool, mm -hmm. I kind of pulled back a little bit. No kidding. Yeah. But uh, luckily, so strangely enough, I, I took a pretty big stint away from D&D. And then uh, uh, actually when I met my wife, um, mm -hmm. I decided for the first time that when I was going to date someone, I was going to be completely honest about the fact that I'm a giant geek. Like that's normally something you, you, you don't bring up right away and you give it a few years or decades before you start. We all have like who you are. hand codes and everything back in the day. <laughs> what, are so these books, I, uh, what are these books, John? What, why, why are they, what, what, what are these for? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just, I just told her flat out. It's like, listen, I, I play D and D I read comics. I, I love cheesy Japanese martial arts movies. Like this, this is who I am. And for whatever reason, cause God off, she's way better than I am. She decided to go with me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I didn't actually start playing D and D again until my first deployment. Uh, I was deployed with a guy that, uh, that was really big into D and D and we didn't have, really have anything else to do after you work your 12 to 14 hour shift. So we'd go hang out we'd get a group together and we played D and D. And uh, strangely enough, he actually lives down the road from me now, and we still play D&D &D together. 
Yeah, that's great. I, one of the things we've often talked about, John, I think you and I have talked about it too, is the relationships you form. Uh, one of the big thrills for me going to Gen Con in a couple of days is going to be just seeing the people that I only see there. I know Brian can attest to these things too. Um, he sees a lot of people and, and uh, everybody knows Brian anyway, but I, I can tell that he really enjoys that, uh, that aspect of it. So like, what's your favorite thing about it? I mean, you're a writer, so I think naturally people would think story, but like, as a player or a GM, whichever you want to take, uh, what is it that's really your favorite thing? Uh, so for me, it's it's always about character creation. Um, I love the ability to just create some bizarre, bizarre character concepts. Um, and I'm not even by far the best at it. Uh, strangely enough, the, the best person I've ever seen at character creation when it comes to, and I won't even say min-maxing, I will just say straight up creativity, is uh, the son of one of my friends. Uh, the kid's like, 20 something now but when he was in his in his teens he decided that the character he really wanted to play was a wizard's apprentice who had gotten turned into a monkey and but he was a psionic character and so he would literally dominate regular people have them dress up in robes and he would sit on their shoulder like a familiar and then the human would get wasted like they'd be in the middle of combat and everyone would be like kill the wizard and totally annihilate this human and then the monkey would just blast him with psionics and then go find another human to use as, as a medium. It was that brilliant. Is, that's outstanding. You can tell him that another GM thinks that's a great idea too. That is killer. I, I know sometimes I, I struggle with the people who create character concepts like I'm a blind monk, but then they talk about all the ways they're going to make themselves basically be able to see. It's like, well, then why are you blind? You know, like right. go with it. You know, like, like what's the point of taking all your disabilities away after you give yourself one? But uh uh, so, uh, so last question, I guess on that round Robin is, uh, best GM, you can include yourself, best GM you have ever played with and why? Uh, so uh, the, the same guy that I played with in, in Iraq and the same guy that I still play with now, I still think is, is probably my favorite GM. Um, and it's not just that he spends an, an asinine amount of money on Dwarven Forge, but he, but it uh, helps. yeah, it helps. I'm it really right there. Does. I'm right there with him. <laughs> But he uh, he's a really good storyteller, but he has zero problem embarrassing himself in front of us by making the most asinine voices for the character for the NPCs. And so, uh, yeah, you really get involved and, and, and engrossed in the story because he has zero problem busting out some crazy voices. Cool. Yeah, people who go all in are a lot of fun. So, so as we like I said in the in the intro, you know, we've had several guests on that have talked about various aspects of of role playing. Most recently, uh, Anna Meyer talked about map making and how for her often and I agreed with her, it's true for me as well. The uh, the idea for the game comes in a visual. You know, I see something or I recall something from a film or a book, and that's the genesis point for me. Um so when we talk about story, obviously the story I think is essential. There's no way to get away from it. So it's definitely one of the pillars. Um, I think tonight we want to talk about the, the role that writing plays. So just a little bit of background on you though. How did you get started? How did you get started writing? Like when, what was the impetus? Was it something you were always doing and then just ramped it up or you just started? So I, like I said, I've always been a storyteller. Uh, I've always been that kid that got in trouble in class for talking and, and, you know, I'd come back from a vacation and everyone would hear about it. Like that, that's just the type of person I was. Um, and I had a really interesting story idea when I was in college actually. And, uh, the story was called, uh, eyes in the nut house. And it was about this guy that's slowly going insane. And I talked to my girlfriend at the time about it. It's she was, word. she was all on board. She thought it was an awesome story idea. And she, she encouraged me to write. And I did. I wrote about 100 pages in this before I graduated. And uh, it was awful. Just so god awful. And uh, the funny, the story I always love telling is I sent it to my mom because I wanted to make sure there was a digital copy of this that existed somewhere because I knew I was going in the military. It was going to be a while until I got around to it again. And I told her she didn't have to read it. If she wanted to, feel free. So, of course, she read it. And it was years later when I'd actually started writing and doing a much better job at it. Um, that she told me that if I had actually paid her five dollars to read that story again, she would have bought an overpriced cup of coffee and still not read it. <laughs> <laughs> so you bring up an interesting point, though. This is something I'm always curious about with people. Where was the point? And feel free uh, during this. John has written a lot of stuff. Everybody out there, uh, he's written several books, nine books, ten. Books? Uh, the twelfth one just came out. 
12. Okay. So he's written a lot of stuff. So feel free to, to use your own stuff as examples in this. You know, I'm interested in what you've written and what, what you're, what you're doing, but how do you know, like, what is the hallmark of knowing when you're getting better? I mean, a lot of people, I think toil, you know, for a long time, is it feedback? Is it, uh, is it just self-awareness? Is it reading other people's stuff and seeing, okay, I see how they deal with these problems. Maybe I should adopt. Well, how do you, how do you handle that? And when do you know? I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I firmly believe that I am never going to get past this idea of imposter syndrome where at any point people are going to realize my books actually suck and they've been spending money on nut for nothing. They don't suck. Um, they don't suck. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I don't know when you get used to people recognizing your books or recognizing your name. Um, cause we're, I'm an author. People don't recognize my face. Like people right. are going to walk by and be like, I think I've read your books. I've never recognized the cover, but they're never going to be like, Oh my God, you're John messenger. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think that it's definitely not feedback because, uh, any author will tell you like never read the feedback. If, if you've ever gone to Goodreads or Amazon and read the feedback, um, I would legitimately think my books absolutely suck. But uh, I, th I think the first time that I realized that I was actually getting good at this and, and this might actually be something I would do is uh, I started doing the convention routes. I started going to some book conventions and I started doing comic cons and I was at a comic con one time and someone came up and they're like, oh, I just read your, your series talking about my steampunk series. And my natural reaction, my first response is always like, <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> and uh, then they started describing the first book. They're like, oh, well, it takes place up in the frozen north, and there's the werewolves and the oil refinery. And I was like, I was like, holy shit, you've actually read my book. So I think that it's always funny because people assume that uh, when you meet someone that, that they consider famous, because I don't consider myself famous, but some people meet me and they're like, you know, I've, I re I've read your books, or I recognize your name, and, and they get all excited, and they don't realize that I'm way more excited than they are. Like I'm doing the, right. I'm doing the, uh, the Japanese schoolgirl thing. Like, ah, <laughs> right on. Yeah. I think people connect with, I think people just naturally connect with, uh, people who make things that they fall in love with. So there's that you're like the creator of those things. So mm -hmm. naturally some of that, I imagine just spills over onto the author because you're the person who dreamt it all up. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, I would love to say that I'm actually a lot like my characters. I'm definitely not. Um, I think that if people wanted to go party with me thinking that it's as much fun as some of the characters I've written, they'd be sorely disappointed. Yeah. The imagination doesn't have to reflect the uh, inner landscape of the author. That's for sure. Yeah. Our, our people are natural introverts. And so uh, the idea of, uh, I mean, going to a convention is exhausting by the end of the day. Like everyone's like, Hey, let's go out and party. And I'm just like, <laughs> I think I'm just gonna take a nap. So. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. So, um, so you've written several series. I'd like to talk about the most recent one, the magic and machinery, uh, series, but I think it's good to put it in a little bit of context. So that's the latest thing you've written. Where did it start? Like what are the other series about, you know, just in brief. So we have some context for what this, how this new one is different and new. Yeah. So, uh, um, I, I've, my, I have three series out right now on one standalone book and they are, they're probably as different as different can be. Um, the first series that I actually wrote and completed was The Brink of Distinction, and it was a sci-fi series, but it was told from the perspective of an alien alliance trying to stop the spread of humanity. Um, and then I, I, I grew up reading science fiction. That was always my passion. And so I just figured I was going to stick with science fiction. And I wrote a standalone book called uh, uh, Rage, which is, um, it's a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde in space. So a guy gets exposed to this virus, and now every time he has a spike of adrenaline, whether from anger or excitement or anything else, he loses control and becomes a little bit cannibalistic. That's what you do. That's what you do. When you yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pastime. And then, uh, uh, so I wrote those books uh, before I had a publishing contract or anything else, and I, I threw a fluke, and I will openly admit through a fluke, I stumbled onto a publishing contract. Um, for a contemporary take on Avatar The Last Airbender. So it's this four book series about uh, the four elements battling as, as fire is trying to destroy the planet. Um, and it's my least favorite series, but my best selling by far. So uh, I'm a super, I'm a huge fan of Avatar Last Airbender. So anybody who does anything to expand or tell interesting stories in that universe or even like, 
an analog to that universe I find very interesting. I love that elemental. Uh, they really nail it in that in that series. Which one's that called? What's that called? So uh, the, it's called World of Flame, and the first book is Wind Warrior. Um, oh, okay. And, I saw that on your website. Okay, yeah. gotcha. So the, the funny thing about that is that uh, I wrote it as part of a writing competition for this, this publisher, and they were doing this anthology. They wanted uh, novellas, so about 100-page stories. And they had these pictures, and one of the pictures, you could you basically picked a picture and you wrote a story about it. And one of the pictures was this, this girl trapped in this bubble uh, and this guy standing outside of it looking like he was trying to free her. And I fully admit, 100% openly admit, that I was like, well, I'm going to take it from the opposite direction and say that the guy put her in the bubble uh, because that's part of his power. And I straight up took a contemporary take on Avatar The Last Airbender. And the publisher really liked it and said, hey, we want to offer you a publishing contract, but we want this to be a series. And I was like, no, you don't understand. Like, this is a 100-page story that's very derivative of Avatar The Last Airbender. I can't make this a series. It already exists. It's an anime. People know it. And they're like, no, we want something something uh, from you. And so I, I wound up writing this four-book series, and I really had to take it. I was like, okay, so I started with Avatar. How do I make it my own? And so, uh, yeah, it definitely goes off the rails, books two through four, and goes a totally different direction. <laughs> nice. So, 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 go ahead. I was going to say, I have, so, to, I'll have to check it out. And go. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. That was all. That was all. That, was, that was. Stop being Midwestern, guys. Just someone start talking. I think um, John, John was uh, getting to a great point. He said, I, I don't know when I get better as a writer. And I was, I was just going to interject that uh, I think you get better with every book. So simply by doing, you should be gaining skill and getting better, right? So you know you're better because you just put out another product. You put out another book. Yeah. I can't disagree. The practice makes me a better writer. I'm a fair writer now. And uh, I just find that every time I take breaks, long breaks between things, and then when you come back, suddenly – you just construct things a little tighter. You're better mm -hmm. with your economical use of words. You're learning how to write dialogue better, that kind of stuff. It just kind of happens as a function of time. And it's a muscle. I mean, it's, it's just right. like anything else. You know, the more you use it, the more easily it flows and the more words come together. And because and, wording is hard. Wording is hard. Yeah, wording is hard. Matt, I think it was Col Matt Colville who said, you should become a writer if you like long, lonely, terrifying moments in the dark trying to figure out the next line. Uh, oh. if, if, you can, if you can live with that and be somewhat happy, you'll, you can, you'll get better over time. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that's some of your early work, but what is uh, – so tell us a little bit then about Magic and Machinery. I've had the privilege of actually uh, – engaging with this story as an RPG, but I'd like to hear a little bit about the actual, the book. All what right, so uh, awesome product placement. What can, what can we say about this the- This is the uh, plug, this is the plug, John, don't blow it. So Magic and Machinery, um, I'll, I'll get to the backstory about how this all came about a little bit in a little bit, but uh, Magic and Machinery is a steampunk series that's best described as Sherlock Holmes in a world of magic. So uh, this is a world that was very much embracing science and was creating steam power and zeppelins were in the were filling the air. Um, and then about 10 to 12 years before these books take place, there was this massive earthquake that shook the earth or shook the world. And all of a sudden in the southern continent and nearly gets split in two. And uh, from out of this rift that's created comes creatures of myth. And all of a sudden the world starts getting invaded by werewolves and vampires and things like that. Um, and so the whole story takes place on the northern continent, which is called Acre. And in Acre, they shut down the borders. They get this isolationist mentality, and they create these royal inquisitors whose sole purpose is to go hunt down any reports of magic and destroy them. And so the main character is a Sherlock Holmes-type character, uh, but he's a royal inquisitor, and it's his job. Each book is a different investigation, hunting down werewolves, vampires, uh, uh, Frankenstein's monster, and the most recent one is witches um, as he hunts down all these reports of magic. Yeah. Cool. The, so, uh, oh, go ahead, man. Go ahead, man. And the main characters drag through the mud constantly, which is makes for very entertaining reading. Oh yeah, I have no respect for my main character. John, John is terrible too. <laughs> yeah, when we start talking about characterization later, I want to come back to this because I think the things that often make a good separate a a great writer from someone who is merely proficient is conflating assumptions. Uh, you know, you read a book and you assume the hero is going to struggle, but I think, you know, people like George Martin and people like that have really shown us that, you know, really 
making these people struggle. You know, get a deep, uh, like at the core of their being is something that I think really resonates with people. So I love hearing about your, I have yet to read this series, uh, but it's going to go on my list right after Gen Con. Um, I, I've heard Matt say many times that this lead character just gets thrashed massively. Now, how are the, how are the books laid out though? It, it's kind of a point. How does the point of view work? Uh, so it's a, it's a third person, uh, considered third person omniscient. So uh, you kind of do some head hopping as the t- different chapters go about um, and you kind of get to see different perspectives. And, it, and I do that primarily because nothing in this world is straightforward. Um, every one of the characters has its own secrets. And uh, as you kind of bounce around between the characters, you start to learn more and more, not just about the world, but about their relationships. Um, and that's really what the book was all about. I mean, kind of we talked about it earlier with, with my, my love of D&D and character creation. And that's really where this, this book series started was with the characters and their interactions. And then what kind of story can I build around it? Yeah, that's something I want to touch back on with the, with the group later when we jump back to talking about story is just how you create that web of characters and when you know it's balanced enough or how much you create before you just start getting the story involved. So uh, the new book uh, is uh, Aptura Iris, but without just a little bit of a pricey on the previous books, uh, it right. might not make a whole lot of sense but please feel free to talk a little bit about that yeah so the most recent book um and uh i I apologize to anyone who's actually read the series because it took me about three years to get this fourth book published um but it is by far the biggest book i've ever published it's uh 140,000 words um so it definitely came in with some heft to it and awesome (laughs) but uh yeah this is a the rest of the this is the books and and not to give anything away but some of the criticism is people are like, oh, well, it's a Sherlock Holmes story, but I figured out who the bad guy was pretty early on. But that was never the point of these books. It doesn't matter if you know who the bad guy is. It's why the bad guy is the villain is really the twist um, to the story. Um, and book one really is, is the shining example of that, where it's not too hard to figure out who the bad guy actually is. You figure it out probably about halfway through the book. But when you get towards the end of the book and you realize why he's the bad guy, all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's definitely an interesting twist on it. Um, but this fourth book was the first time that I really wanted to do just a straight up uh, whodunit. Um, the whole slew of cast of characters, a whole lot of misdirection about who the bad guy might be, um, and keeping you guessing the entire time where you think the, throughout the entire book, it's obvious it's clearly going to be this guy, and it, it clearly isn't. Um, and so uh, a whole lot of, of whodunit. And that was actually the fun thing about this series was I wanted to write a series, and if you've ever watched Bones, that's kind of how the books are laid out. Now, every book is a start and finish of an investigation, but there's an overarching storyline that goes on throughout the entire series. Um, and that's kind of one of the fun things about the series is I can make each book whatever I want it to be. If I want to do a horror book, then I write a horror book, and it's, that investigation just happens to be horrific and t- frightening and terrifying. If I want to do that whodunit murder mystery, then I do a whodunit murder mystery. If I want to do a straight action, you know, to the book two, for instance, um, which again, I really can't give too much away about the ending on that. But <laughs> if you want to just get into straight action, then yeah, I mean, those books exist. And that was the fun thing about this series so far is every book I can make it whatever I want to because there's an overarching storyline and you know these characters now. And I think uh, that's, I, go ahead, Matt. I said, I've kind of felt the, um, I never felt like figuring out who the bad guy was as you already said, was part of the story either. So that, so mission accomplished there, but I've always kind of felt like it's a crisis. It's, it's a crisis for the, for the main characters. Like how are they going to react to it? Not necessarily who did it, but right. how, how do they, uh, how do they take the law in one hand and their moral, their moral um, compass in the other hand and, and find a middle ground, which I, which I find fascinating in the books. Yeah, that kind of brings up that same issue of a lot of people read books to figure out those types of books to figure out who did it. But when you tell them halfway through, essentially, now they're like, well, what the what's the rest of this book for? You know, <laughs> like, and then and then I think you've got them, you know, in, in a much more visceral way mm-hmm. than you may have at the beginning when their assumptions were simpler and more straightforward. Well, uh, so at this point, I'd just like to take a, a quick break uh, and and just say that we're going to we're going to. Uh, move on to our first segment. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, virtual tabletop just to kind of break it up a little bit. And then we're going to be coming back with uh, um, 
we're going to be coming back uh, to talk with uh, Brian and John about uh, writing and designing, making that process easier and how that works. We'll all chip in, of course, but I think that's going to be kind of Brian's thing. So uh, I'm going to kick it over to Jimmy uh, and just uh, kind of open it by saying, Jimmy is the guy here, everybody I think knows now who's been watching for a while, who runs things virtually. And uh, he runs most of his games uh, in Fantasy Grounds, uh, and he he has very well-attended games. The games are really interesting to listen to. I recommend anybody who has a chance to check him out on Praetor's Rejects or check out uh, his stuff on uh, – we'll have a schedule down on the Doodly Doo at some point um, the -doo. to check it out. It. But how do you maintain that story? How do you keep them involved when you're not there physically with them? Um, extrapolating stories and so forth. Uh, just – Let's just talk a little bit about that, Jimmy. Well, let me see. Bring up. Oh, don't do that. That's bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, should move. And do OBS out of the way. There you go. There's the virtuality there. No, I. Uh, so in the virtual realm, um, when you have the storyline uh, coded for you, and that's we're just taking in the fantasy grounds or even the roll twenty into the tabletops. One of the it's tools is going to be that adding on to what has been written and created uh, out of the book or the module, so to speak. And I've just got a few pulled up here of some of the, I think music uh, and effects are paramount for what you're doing online as a virtual DM uh, to get that engagement to the players. Um, they can only listen to a drone voice, a DM voice for so long. Um, we'll talk about voices in a second, the actually acting part, because if you look at something like the critical role, their forte of being voice actors has brought that talent to that show. But I think that if you're looking as the DM side on the virtual Sirenscape, which I think everybody knows about, if you haven't used it, try it out. It is a changer, I believe, uh, as far as bringing uh, that extra immersive part to the game. And there are several sure. tutorials out there that we use that actually we have the effects coded so that when something happens in game, like a magic missile or fireball, we've got the sound effects that will automatically go off when those things happen in the game. And the player then gets that extra oomph uh, engagement. What, uh, what application do you use? You haven't mentioned it. I'm surprised. Serenscape. Oh, I don't know. Oh. Fantasy grounds. What are you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm pretty sure he's got a tattoo. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Can't it's actually show it on TV. Yeah. It's across his knuckles. It's like F his channel. His yeah. channel is also an adult channel, so you can maybe see that tattoo. It's, yeah. Oh man, it's across hurting. the knuckle, all right. Only yeah. for tips. Only. Yes, listen to him. It's it's like this all the time. <laughs> I'm the stepchild. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you get fantasy grounds across your knuckles, and then you realize, ooh, I ran out of knuckles. That's right. <laughs> they misspell it. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, if Xerenscape going from there, uh, some are the budget friendly kind, well then I'll recommend tabletop audio where their sound sets are either played through a player online, or you can actually download the full nine to 10 minute or even some longer loops of the MP3 onto your machine and play it through your, I use the, I still a good old Winamp man. Do I know? Winamp? What is this? 1997? I love Whip Winamp. that llama's ass. That's right, baby. I love it. Shh. And hey, so, you know, I wanted to say when you mentioned tabletop audio, I don't use their soundscape so much. Mm -hmm. they're, they're great. And, and Jimmy's recommendation is 100% accurate. But they have this thing called SoundPad. Yeah. Here it that is. allows you to customize sound effects. And that is really great, too. Same. <laughs> yeah, perfect. And so you get that. And with your ear, if you've got a ear keypad that you use, I think Danny's talking about that. You can then pop those things in and out uh, and run that. Uh, also, um, just in streaming in general, uh, if we always worried about our music and the rights and things like that, and I've let Danny know about that, one of the other services that I use a lot is Pretzel Rocks. And mm, yep. you link that awesome. into your Twitch account. And now when you're playing this music that is DRM free, the only thing that you have to show, and it, sh and it actually puts it in the chat log, is the artist and the song, and they get the recognition for it, and you get all this music and there's tons of variety of different flavors for you. Um, they're still growing their catalog, but I use it. I love it playing it when I'm doing some of the background, either painting or running a game or something like that. And I don't want the game's repetitive music happening all the time. 
So that's pretty awesome. I didn't realize you could you could um, uh, integrate it with Twitch. That's great. Yeah, you do. Yeah, and so boom, you're in. All they want is the artist recognition showing up while this play while the song's playing, and they get that little oomph, and boom, it is perfect for Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, all of the above. Um, so when we're chatting about that, I mean, that's, you know, music is there. Uh, we talked about voices and I have a voice, you know, I am not an actor by no means. Uh, and so I have to use electronic help to make my voice do certain things, which we will do in the game sometime. And I will change up the voice. Or act like a little devil. That's kind of fun stuff. You know, play it around. And Dude, that is <laughs> Fucking amazing! <laughs> that yeah. is so good, Jimmy. You I just blew my mind. My I did not expect you to do that. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, well, I have a Cylon program too. I needed to twist it up here, but I love using that. But yes, I love throwing the God voice into a game uh, or some little What's imp devil. One? And yes, uh, that's right, Doom, Doom. And so that's yeah. Anyway, yes, that's Megatron. Yeah. What's, now, that what's that one getting, the question is, uh, you're throwing all this stuff at the players, but how do you know they're getting into it? Uh, because it's a virtual DM, the, the storyline is there. That should be engrossing enough, but the presentation matters. And so I think the, we're back to the audio side, the auditory listening to what they're engaging. And if they're playing, they're role playing it out. They're having fun with it. You know, you've got them hooked. Then if you have those players that are not into it, then how do you pull it out of them? And I think that's a tough part. And I, you know, I don't think there's any tool that's a lot you're going to do as a DM. You've got to have to listen and bring them out. I've got some players that like the quiet play. They're the quiet PC. They don't talk a lot and they're into the game because they're PM me questions left and right about what they can do with their character. They just don't want to talk. Uh, right. So you have to, you know, I, that, trying to extrapolate that I'm talking about, because when you get to the storyline and I run, pretty much strictly almost all content that's already been created modules and stuff like that. And so I've known the ones I'm running over and over and over, you can then, you know, what's going on the storyline. And if there's something that a player is not getting or they're missing out on all that, then I know something that's coming up. I can twist that just a tad to get them engaged. Or how is it that I can throw a curveball at them that brings them out so they have to deal with it? Because the rest of the people, the rest of the team is getting on and they're having fun with it. But it may be missing someone there and I try to I'm trying to find those it's, it's been rare for me I'm not saying that you know that it, it can happen but I've luckily have not had too many players that are not gotten into it they all want to try to be a critical role you know person um, well that brings up the ne- kind of the next point like mm-hmm. what about the obverse of that like the people who who really overachieving our peers uh yeah you have to tone them down so much and that's usually uh death uh, it's either, or, uh, so it's, uh, they, uh, took a wrong turn and they went right into a gelatinous cube or, uh, I've had one and I've, I'll pick on the, one of the recent ones I actually stream on this show on our channel, the Friday night deal. We've got one, and one of the guys is very much into his character and he started throwing, well, I think it was fire bolts and stuff. And so he was, and he was very into it and all he was doing, he set the forest on fire. Uh, and so now he's got to deal with that because he has now gone deal with Smokey the Owl Bear, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so I threw that curveball at him, you know, and he was like, "What?" And so that was our running little gag for a while because now was he going to set everything on? Now he got into Fandolin. Was he going to set that on fire? Was he going to set the NPCs on fire and all that? And so that you reel them in a little bit. Usually, though, what I'll say is that if we've got one that's having a little too much fun and all that put him down on the ground, you know, um, he gets hit from behind <laughs> and now he's got to deal with that. And, you know, but I love the frankness with which this is being just <laughs> discussed openly. Like I was, I was half suspecting Jimmy to be like, well, sometimes I take him aside and I say, you know, it's important to pass the conk every once in a while, you know, mm-hmm. so everybody can have their fair time. No, he just fucking just kills him. people. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Fun. No, the elemental, with it. the and earth elemental steps on your head just yeah. to make sure. <laughs> But you knock them down a little bit. You cut them out, and so they get That's it. That's not knocking them down a little bit. You literally killed them. I killed them. So I kill them. I'm not, not bad with it. I think, I, think, I think these virtual games have, like, a cheaper value placed on life, maybe. I, something we should probably put in an upcoming episode is, like, what's the value of life in a virtual game? That's great. Apparently. 
Yeah, that so is really go. good. So, so, um, so when you do go off, off the module, you run these a lot of times, like mm-hmm. what kind of stuff do you do? I mean, do you keep notes? Like it always goes wrong at the, at the crossroads and wish you could know that that was going to be consistent play. Cause you, as you well know, <laughs> you run that one module and it's going to be taken five different directions and it will never sure. ever be the same. And that's why I like, I, there's a particular, a few of them like the Fandelver or the one we're running, uh, the, it's the dragon heist. There's just, I just like the way they're written, the way they flow. And it was interesting. We were chatting. I, th- uh, I think was wasn't it? Kamer was put a question out there about his module that he wanted to talk about. Should he write one that's from one to twelve or one to twenty on the levels mm-hmm. and all that? I like the smaller subset ones because I think that you've got more. There's more room to work with in that storyline uh, and options to do things other than the long drawn out one. I was not a fan of. Uh, Princes of the Apocalypse, and I really wasn't a fan of Out of the Abyss. I just didn't get into that one. Um, so that, but that's just me as the DM, and it translates differently from the tabletop and the virtual. Uh, you know, one of the other things we're talking about in engagement is with virtual the maps, and I would I was going to show the directory of what I've got from just the couple of years now with Patreons that I've subscribed to. I got I got more than I'll ever be able to do anything with. You know, right. and they're still coming in because I still support yeah. some of these artists. But I think the maps on the virtual tabletop side are just as important too. So there you go. And they're so oh. good. Mm-hmm. Yep. I will say for uh, just real quick, I know we didn't uh, we didn't pre-record this to have links, but if um, anybody's interested out there, Voice Meter Banana. Yep, mm-hmm. Voice Meter Banana. That's an option what? to, uh, yeah, just just go with it. Uh, I, it's let it happen. I have no idea what you're talking about, but I love it. It's uh, it's an app that, or it's a, a program you can run on your computer to basically make a virtual soundboard, and you can run all of your audio through it and output it wherever you want. I'll put some links uh, in, the, yeah. in the it's description. A it's, yeah. it's a mixer board, yeah. and uh, that has enabled me to just use. Wave files or whatever I want on my computer, so I can just play something on my computer and it runs through the audio as well. So it's a free option. They ask for donation. It's a donationware application. Mm-hmm. Voice Meet Banana, but uh, yeah, that's another option out there. Yep. So there we go. Hey. Virtual. Yeah. Well, that that episode. that is fascinating. I I I sometimes really wonder. I know you only recently have started having all video people present and it really amazed me when we talked earlier uh, this week or maybe it was last week about being able to run just with their voices though just hearing people talk that to me is mega daunting like i i consider myself a pretty good gm that is like the edge of the cliff that i like would be a little freaked out by so uh GM versions for me are new i'll be honest with you so my other first couple of years were all pretty much just voice and so mike what i'm relating right now is basically dealing with that platform the cams bring a whole another aspect into it into the game and all that and i'll be up and i'm still learning some of that. Yeah. I just person. love watching your players. I, <laughs> even if they're not role playing, I just love watching what they're doing while they're not role playing. Uh, it, it's really fun. And and shout out for uh, Friday nights. Uh, not this coming Friday, of course, but Friday nights. Jimmy, why don't you tell them what you're doing? Friday nights, right here. Woo! I can't get my hand <laughs> right. Yeah, there we go. So there's the. Might need some contrast back there. There's the ca- Friday nights. Lost Minds of Fandelver. <laughs> Uh, I think actually and Jay sitting out here hitting Bashman. Yeah, Bashman's out there, one of the players. Uh, so it's uh, newbies to the channel and some newbies to D&D um, are playing this module, and we run 8 to almost midnight on Fridays. So there you cool. go. Cool. Yep. So I really encourage everybody to check out Jimmy's uh, stream because it is uh, super fun to watch, and uh, and it's engaging, and you get to see a really awesome GM uh, laying it down. And if anybody starts talking with an English accent, Jimmy will just fucking kill you. You know, that's just the way it goes. And uh, so beware, you know, if your dwarf just has to say shit like, well, I don't know where I'm going to go, be prepared to be slaughtered almost immediately. Uh, so, so we're just going to take up, we're going to pause here for some 
station ID before we get back to uh, to John and Brian's discussion about writing and and all the things that go into designing and so <laughs> forth that they're that they're that they've learned. Uh, this is Wizards of the Couch uh, with the four uh, amiable wizards. We're joined tonight by John Messenger, uh, the author uh, most recently of the Magic and Machinery series. Um, I should probably say before we start this next segment that we are. Um, John is working with us. Uh, we are publishing his stuff uh, uh, for the Magic and Machinery series. He's written or is in the process of writing, but he's already written two installments in a four installment series uh, based on in his world of Ocker or his continent of Ocker. Uh, what's the name of the world, John? Illyrium. Yes, there you go. So uh, some of what we talk about tonight, we can touch on that directly. Uh, one of the questions we didn't get to with John earlier was what's the difference between writing it for a story and writing it for an adventure so that I, hopefully that'll come up when you all talk. So why don't we jump right back in with that now? Uh, Brian, uh, you have been responsible for producing a lot of role-playing content. People who do not know Brian, uh, he is a fixture at, con uh, at conventions, but he is also the uh, owner of Total Party Kill Games. Uh, you can find him online a lot of places. We should get those links in the doobly-doo for, for the after con game. Uh, but he's written a lot of stuff, and he's produced a lot of stuff with other writers, so he's got a lot of experience with that. And i just like to hear uh, Brian kind of take it away, and uh, sure. John and the rest of us just join in, but I'm really interested to hear what John has to say about it. So go ahead, Brian. Oh, yeah. So I think John is going to love hearing the jaded and very honest opinions that I have about writing. Um, I'm going to start with my first point. And again, I hope your kids are in bed. Writing is fucking hard. <laughs> for, the, for those of you who have never actually looked into writing, um, there's structure, there's content, there's characters, there's story and character development. Um, it's more than you just saying, sitting down and go, you know what? I'm going to write a novel today. I think, I think that's a great idea. Let's do this. Um, there's so much more to it than simply that. However, it's possible. Uh, and the moment that you've written anything, no matter how good or how bad, you are a writer. And from that moment on, you only have to get better with every step that you take, every fanfic novel that you put out, every, every you know, new adventure that you write. Just get a little bit better. And soon you too can be as famous as I am not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Is that pretty accurate, uh, John? Uh, yeah. So it's, it's funny that you bring up that... Uh that it's not as easy as sitting down and saying, I'm going to write a novel because I have had way too many conversations with people that basically start off with, Oh, you're a writer. That's fantastic. When I retire, I think I'm going to write a novel too. <laughs> well, fantastic jackass. You go right ahead and hit a novel. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. I got this great um, idea about this. Barbarian. <laughs> I'm just writing down a note. I'm going to invent a monster called the fantastic jackass. <laughs> <laughs> You don't need to talk about Jimmy right now. I mean, that's fine. Ooh, he got oh. But at least he called you fantastic. Exactly. Thank you. Got Thank fired. You. Um, I, I guess the other thing, that, well, I've got a whole list of things that I was going to talk about. But um, again, I think John will probably agree. If you're a beginning writer, um, write what you know is very true. You should start with what you're passionate about and what you know about in order to be believable to your reader. Uh, that's also why I do dark fantasy because, hmm, and you're never going to see, you're never going to see me do my little pony fan fiction. It's never going to happen. Right. So write about what you know and write about something that you enjoy. That way, maybe your readers will enjoy what you write. I'm a little curious why you think it's mutually exclusive for My Little Pony to be dark fantasy. I mean, there's there's <laughs> lots of room. there's I lots mean, of room could... there. There's lots of room, man. <laughs> Can you tell I don't read My Little Pony. I'm just I'm saying. Gonna, I'm gonna write so, a novel. so so Brian, when you say write what you know, but like, what what do you mean by that? Obviously, you don't live in a fantasy world. You don't know how to cast magic. So what do you mean by write what you? <laughs> the hell you say? <laughs> well, obviously, you do know what you're talking about because you're a fucking wizard. Uh, <laughs> But, but how do you, what do you mean by write what you know when it comes to fantasy? Is So that's an excellent point, okay? Um, but 
it, the writing world is not exclusive to fantasy. Um, some people are writing vampire erotica, and I don't know how you become an expert in vampire erotica. Okay, I'm not writing it, so I don't know. Right. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, you have to find what you're passionate about. Again, that goes back to that last one. Mm. Um, right. So, so dark fantasy is what I loved, what I adored. Uh, you know, I'm a child of the '70s and the '80s. Horror movies were amazing. Couple that with D&D. It's really easy to see me listening to Alice Cooper playing D&D modules, right? It, it all yep. makes sense. Um, Every Iron Maiden not, cover ever. Fuck yes. It, but it's not for everyone, right? So somebody out there is like, that bird guy is an asshole because he doesn't like My Little Pony. And he is going to write an amazing My Little Pony thing. I don't know what My Little Ponies do. I just want uh, you to know that someone out there is about to write a My Little Pony fanfic where uh, you get screwed over. Yeah, probably it's going to be in it. It's, yeah. it's for and, and I applaud him for it. Yes. So be a but that's my point. Is the iceberg, and that'll be I, you. I'll pay for it. Right. Right. <laughs> is you have to know what you love, and you have to have a modicum of knowledge about that topic to make it believable and realistic so that the reader can actually believe in the story that you're telling. Yeah, That's I, I right. would say that the, the write what you know, but just know that the first thing you write is going to suck. Yeah. Even now, the, the first draft of every book I write is horrible. And I have to go back and I spend weeks editing and then it goes to an editor and then it goes to a proofreader and it goes to everything else. The, the simple fact is I suck at spelling. Like I'll just tell you flat out, I'm not a good speller, but I've got an editor that makes sure that I don't suck. So it's exactly you know, write what you know. Um, yeah. But I would also say that the large part of that is, is, is coming to the understanding that what you know doesn't necessarily translate exactly into writing a book. You know, you know D and D and I can tell you all day long. Okay. Well, my guy, my character casts magic missile, but for the reader, the reader doesn't want to read. He casts magic missile. He wants a description of what happens when you cast magic missile and oh, make and bridging that gap. Lightning, is, is bolt, tough. lightning bolt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I fire magic missile of the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have a, so I, I have a question about that. So when you write that first draft, are you trying as hard as you can to write it right the first time? And it just turns out not to be that good. Or are you just banging it out to get that first crappy one out of the way? Uh, both, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, I'm a, I'm a very anal, uh, uh, Sorry, this is not the time for a dramatic pause. A very <laughs> anal plotter. <laughs> so, yeah. but I, I, I'm very big about plotting out my stories ahead of time because I, I really think that foreshadowing is what makes a book. Not just foreshadowing, but one of my favorite authors growing up was Frank Herbert. And his ability to world build in Dune to the point that there's sometimes, like, you just get a comment that just says, and then they fought in the robot wars. And like, that's the whole comment in the entire book. But there he had done enough backstory and research into his own world that his son was able to pick it up and write two trilogies on it. Right. right. And that's, I, I do a lot of that plotting ahead of time so that as I'm writing, it kind of flows a little bit better. Um, but the simple fact is when you're writing, if you sit there and wait for inspiration to strike, it's going to take you 24 years to finish the book. You're going to be George R. R. Martin. But so if you're willing... <laughs> If you're willing to sit down and just write for like an hour a night and just hammer something out and know that sometimes those chapters are going to be shit. They're going to be absolutely awful. But you have to push through that plot point to get to something else. And later on, when you go back to edit, you can fix that. You can smooth right. that over. Just realizing that getting it down on paper is far more important than waiting for inspiration. For the film business I side, that, well, I'm sorry. From the film business side, we used to say that you write your first draft with your heart and then you write with your head. So from there on out. Yeah. That's an interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. That, that, that's mm -hmm. definitely what I do. I just get it out. I just mm -hmm. get shit the first one out and then you move on with, with refinement. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Brian, you were saying something. I secretly believe that George R. R. Martin right now is sitting naked in a, in a giant living room with every <laughs> wall covered in post-it notes because <laughs> In order to unveil the plots that he has done in four or five books from now, he's un unleashing, right? You have to think ahead so far 
That's why it takes him so long to write these books, because he's already written them in his head. He's got all these amazing ideas. He just has to make it all flow together cohesively uh, and with the right amount of foreshadowing. I'll say that he's in a unique situation right now because I've never heard of an author who is actually going to publish a novelization of a TV series based off his novels. Right. Right. Well, and the fears that people have that he's going to die before it's all over, that actually happened uh, with Robert uh, Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. yeah. And the guy who took up after him finished those books tidily. So, I mean, I'm not too worried. There's <laughs> there's somebody out there that will be engaged if that guy can't manage to finish it up. <laughs> yeah, I don't Michael think he's Jordan. I don't think he's going to finish him. I, I, I think it'll be just like you said. I think somebody else will do it. I think uh, he is so confused and uh, backwards on on his own story. To your point, Brian, naked for some reason in his in his living room with post-it notes. Um, I mean, the 1996 was when the first one was published. We're over 20 years. I mean, he is not a young fella. Yeah, I mean, he knows his way up from down and the where his books were. I mean, he's probably I, I picture him not naked in his living room watching the uh, original, original episodes uh, going, oh, yeah, that's right. I cut off his head. Oh, the red wedding. <laughs> I, I picture about. him sitting. I picture him sitting in the place of Jack Nicholson in the Overlook Hotel, but he's typing "fuck, fuck, fuck, fuck." <laughs> <laughs> you know that brings up a real interesting point, though, that uh, um, that authors are notoriously bad for forgetting their own plot points. Sure. Hmm. Yeah. And and you know it's it's one of those things we call it the writer's bible. Like every time you you create a new world, you really need to put together these are the characters, this is their description, these are some personality traits. Um, some people go as far as like. You know, what is their favorite food and shit like that? And no one really cares, but it helps you define the characters. I've straight up forgotten character names before. I, I, when I published book four or when I sent my book four to the editor, the editor wrote me back and said, this isn't the character's name, dumbass. <laughs> like I've forgotten stuff before. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if he's sitting here going, wait, I can't write about Ned. He's already dead. My bad. Yeah. I like we, all want him to be, we all want him to be a genius, but Just maybe snap and bring him back. Uh, well, yeah. his books his books came to popularity so late uh i mean <laughs> it's what 2010 i think it was around the time that it started really getting momentum when uh, hbo picked it up is that right mm-hmm. it's about At right 10 or 11, 10 or 11 wow. whatever i mean yeah he had probably forgotten about the series and started m- working on something else so yeah i i, I can 100 percent see that and let's not forget the role of Mojo. Why don't both of you talk a little bit about that? You know, like sometimes the Mojo is just not present. So, yeah, I mean, um, I think you need to write or design every single day, even if it's trash, uh, because it gets you in the habit of writing and designing and it puts you in the right mind space and writing, designing, it's a muscle. Uh, it really is. You have to flex it every single day or you can lose it. So if you go a month without writing a paragraph, guess what? Your paragraph, if you're lucky, is not going to be very great. But if you write even trash every single day, you're going to be much more fluent, much faster, much more creative. Um, John, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, uh, waiting for, for, like I said, waiting for inspiration to strike is, is never really the way to go. Um, it's, uh, it's tough, and I, I know this isn't really the popular opinion, especially when you talk to, uh, to readers, but there are times that you literally just have to put a series to the side and write something else, whether it's a short story or even work on a new novel. Um, I, had a, I had a story come out in between books three and four um for this series and i had a bunch of backlash because people were like well if you have time to write this book you clearly have enough time to work on the magic machinery books and people don't realize that as an author sometimes you get burned out on your own world and sometimes you literally have to take a step back and say i'm going to shelve this i'm still going to write i'm still going to work on something but i just can't work on this right now because if i do it's going to be absolute garbage and so you just rework on something else but like like brian was saying you just keep writing 
that's the important part. Just keep writing no matter what it is. Just realize it's not always going to be in the realm that you want. And John, you touched on a great point too. It's work. It's hard. Um, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort. Um, and especially if you were reading your reviews from some of your earlier work and people are, are just lambasting you because it was your first novel or something, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that can actually take a really heavy mental toll on you and not inspire you. So if, if people are watching and you do like something that John or I have written, my God, please give us a good review. Let us know that you enjoyed it because that one thing can be so inspiring to us that it makes us sit down and just crunch out something amazing. So, so there's an interesting story, actually. Uh, uh, not this year, but the year before. Uh, every year we go to what was Denver Comic Con, now Denver Pop Culture Convention. Um, and we go there every year. And so uh, not this year, but the year before, um, one of the big publishers was there and they were giving away arcs for, for a new book. And it was a superhero book set in West Point. And it sounded really interesting. It was called The Point. And I picked it up. I really enjoyed it. And I'm the type of guy that if I really enjoy a book, I don't mind sending an author a note because what I learned pretty early on, even before I was writing, was that most authors, unless they're huge names, they run their own website. So when you send them an email, they personally get that email and they personally respond to you. And so it was fascinating the first time that I ever sent an author an email. And he's like, hey, I really appreciate it. Thanks, John. And I'm like, holy crap, Like that's actually you. Mm Um, and so I, I sent the author the, this, uh, this note and I was just like, you know, Hey, as a military guy, I really enjoyed the book and, and the realism from West Point and the interaction and the tie-ins with all the superhero stuff. Um, and he wrote me back and it was, it was that perfectly timed email because, uh, the book was getting ready to come out and he had received some negative criticism from some of the big, uh, big critique houses. And he was like this, I needed this email at this time. So if you read something we write and you like it. Leave it, leave a, a fee, see, leave some feedback on Amazon or wherever else, or do just send us an email. Like, even if right. you don't leave an actual uh, review, just send us an email and be like, Hey, this was awesome. Cause it makes our day. It's hmm. exactly right. Yeah. I think yeah. that feedback loop is better. The potential for it is better these days, despite everybody seeming negative. I think there are lots of people out there that want to share love. Uh, and I think there's nothing wrong with saying that it matters. So I, I, I take that point really, really well. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. There's a bunch of crap out there too. Yep. And I think that when we, when we really started stepping up people's ability to self publish through, you know, Kindle and things like that, um, we opened up the floodgates and, and there were millions and millions of, of self-published books that came out and there were some amazing hidden gems. I have read some Kindle books from, from self-published authors that are amazing. And I'm wondering how, how have big publishing companies not found these, these types of books. But on the flip side, um, I picked up a science fiction book one time and the cover was amazing. And I was all intrigued by the storyline or at least the, 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 the uh, blurb on the back. And I started reading it and it started off, the guy goes into a bar and the, and the author was very descriptive. He was six foot two <laughs> and 250 pounds. And then he walks through the back door or back uh, into the back room. And all of a sudden he's 5'10", 175. And I was like, maybe it's a science fiction thing. Like maybe I just haven't got to that part of the book. So I'll push on through. Well, come to find out the author originally had the guy's name as, uh, as Mac, but decided to change his name to Ryan. And he made a fatal flaw of doing a replace all oh, Mac geez. for Ryan. Oh. So when he walks in the back room and he sees the exotic dancer and she's exposing her still Ryan, I was like, no, that's called a stomach jackass, but good job on that one. Wow. So, yeah, that's those are, those are some of the books that you find and you're just like, I'm just going to put this to the side. Yeah. It's like when I was on Amazon looking for some DD stuff and I ran across the orc porn fantasy romance novels and i'm like oh god no i'll send one to jimmy for christmas but i won't read it <laughs> stumbled upon i know I believe, brian's on this brian, track I believe brian means by ran across <laughs> devoured immediately <laughs> devoured listen when you're going through amazon you have to put in certain search words and i don't know what search words you put into it to find orc porn <laughs> good on knows. you nobody Make knows what's the deal with brian it's Make just it part of the room orc porn <laughs> <laughs> get that you guys get that the doobly do Jimmy yes I will yes um, so, so John as a published author 
that is a huge leap from writer, guy who has written a paragraph, right? Um, to actually finish a product is an amazing accomplishment. Uh, I think that everyone wants to be a fantasy author. I think that everyone wants to write gaming products. I think everyone wants to be just simply published, um, maybe for some vanity. But to actually make that happen is quite difficult. So do you have any tips for people who are amateur writers out there right now to become published writers? Like what, what, are, what are some things that take you from point A to point B? Some tips. Um, part of it is, is really, I mean, obviously we talk about story all the time and, and that's kind of the, the, you know, the basis of writing a book in the first place. But what it really boils down to is, is characters have to be believable and so does the dialogue. And believable characters have flaws. Hold on, I'm writing you know, all this down. If all, if all of your characters are basically a MacGuffin, and if you're not familiar with that phrase, it's, it's a superpowered character or superpowered device that gets your main character out of any situation. Um, and whether you like it or not, uh, River was kind of that in Firefly. Yep. Where if you painted them into a corner, River would just go supernatural, big shit on people, and save the day. Not that it was wrong, because it was it was built into the story to be that way. But too many authors wind up doing that. They wind up building their characters unbelievably. Superman. <clears throat> well, there's. There's a, a YA is a, is a is a terrible genre for it. Um, as many good young adult books are as there are out there, there's a whole lot of um, tropes. Like she was the most beautiful person I'd ever seen, and I tell people all the time. I actually told her about it during a panel during Denver this year. I love my wife with all my heart, and she I absolutely married up 100%. But I think she's also aware that she's not the most beautiful person I've ever seen in my life. That's not the way real life works. So when all these all these tropes start coming out in YA and, you know, you have these characters that um, they're clumsy and they're awkward, but they're also black belts in martial arts. You haven't really built a character flaw in there anywhere. Um, <laughs> I have no problems, you know, and part of it, you know, we, we talked about it already where I beat the crap out of my main character physically, emotionally and mentally, whatever I happen to choose for that book. I am not oh, nice yes. to these characters. Um, but you know, Simon is a raging alcoholic and it comes back to bite him in the ass in the, in the series. I think that's why I like the book so much. Well, and yep. that's, it's, it's making those believable characters, I think is, is the first big part of it. But the other big part is, is even though we always say, write what you know, I would also say, write what you don't know. Um, and not because you're trying to get it published, but because writing something that's outside your comfort zone, outside your wheelhouse, number one, makes you practice research. Because that's so important to writing a book is, mm -hmm. is one of the reasons I don't write contemporary stories is because if you write in a world that already exists, you had better be 100% on the place you're talking about. Um, in the, the uh, contemporary Avatar The Last Airbender series, it is modern and they go to London. I was on mm -hmm. Google Earth. Like I was pulling up map views to make sure when I said they go to the station and they go past this building. That's really the building that's, that's there. I want someone to be reading it and say, when they took shelter in this department store and hid in the bathroom, they're like, oh my God, I've been to that bathroom. Like that's, that's the level that I wanted to take this. Um, but when you write outside your wheelhouse, when you write outside that comfort zone, you have to do the research and you have to start practicing. And even if you don't plan on publishing it, you're practicing stuff that's making you uncomfortable, which is gonna make you a better writer in the long run. When you go back to the stuff that you're really comfortable with, you're bringing in some stuff that's outside influences that's going to help make your story unique because that's the biggest problem. Every, every fantasy story struggles to find its voice because fantasy is so well done. You have such amazing authors that already exist in the genre that, yeah, you can get away with saying he's an elf and everyone knows what that is, or he's a dwarf and everyone knows what that is. But at the same time, everyone already knows what that is. So what makes your story so much more unique than everything else out there? So great point. Um, I really especially love your points about tropes. I love tropes, but I like to twist tropes. I like to take a trope that everyone knows and turn it on its head and have people go, oh, I know. It's Wait, whoa. Right. Because I think I think that's a great point. Um, as you mentioned, 
let, let's take a look at every published fantasy game ever, okay? How many of them are truly different from Lord of the Rings? Okay, truly different. Um, I can count them on my one hand, okay? So in order to make it your own, to add your own voice to what you're writing, I, I think that you need to be able to twist tropes and make take things that are familiar, but add a, a unique bend to them. I think that, you know, no matter what you feel about Stephanie Meyer and the Twilight series, I personally cannot stand the books, mm -hmm. but I will <laughs> say that she was, she was successful in one way, which is that she turned the genre on its head. And True. whether you like it or not, if, as soon as you say sparkly vampires, everyone knows what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So she was really successful in that aspect because she took something that everyone thinks everyone who's who's a purist when it comes to vampire lore and said this is absolute bullshit mm -hmm. but you also know exactly what people are talking about if you see sparkly vampires so in that way right. she was successful in taking that trope and twisting it tremendously um, right. i'm a huge and, and, fan myself so uh when that when i watched that i was like i caught on fire watching the films um <laughs> set yourself on fire like nope 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 right I find too that for me, a long time ago, probably it was architecture school that drilled this into me, uh, that uniqueness was not really as important as being interesting. So if if you you don't have to have a unique value proposition, you don't have to have a unique uh, idea, but the idea you have has to be engaging. And there will be elements. Maybe the way you describe it seems unusual and novel. Uh, but, but truthfully, I think it's much more important to create that level of engagement. And I don't know if we're going to, uh, we'll probably have a longer talk about this at some, on some other episode, but I think like Lord of the Rings is not a great fantasy novel. Uh, it's not, I don't think it was really intended to be that. I think there's way better fantasy novels that are significantly different from that, but for whatever reason, that is the touchstone. So I think a lot of things are copied from that, especially in terms of like the character races and the types of characters and all that. The story is what's a little wonky, but all those other things are definitely tropes. And, and I, I think they have a long, uh, they have a long uh, reach but I think what we're seeing these days is so many more people are into the genre that people just by definition are going to come up with new ways of handling this stuff. You know, you're not going to have people who are already established trying to write a version of that. You're going to have people who have never written anything coming up with something really Very out true. of the box. Mm. And terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> because established norms are not going to be norms for the next couple of generations of writers. They might not have ever read Michael Moorcock or Conan. Right. right. <laughs> but that's why, that's why, you know, somebody has to bring those things. They, somebody has to bring those things forward. You know, like, I think it's a lot to expect people to go back and read Conan. The, you know, it, it's, I mean, for nerds, it's not, but like just for a general audience, I think it's a lot to expect people to go back and find that stuff. You got to present new versions of it. Same thing with Fritz Lieber, you know, and all of his, or Lieber, I don't know how you pronounce it, but uh, I would love to see modern adaptations of all those things. Done really well, obviously. Where is, where is HBO right now? Where, where is my good Conan series? Where is my Elric? Where is my Thieves I World? Take an Elric series. Yeah, I would take an Elric series right yeah. now. That would be. Amazon's giving me the Silmarillion, so I'm super stoked. Do is it? that what it is? Yep. That's my favorite mm. Tolkien. And it wasn't even written by John. It was written by his son. Hmm. Huh. I hadn't seen that. Interesting. That'll be an interesting series to see if they can pull off. That's a tough one. It's we'll basically add... like animating the Bible. So, so, you know, the, it, add it gave me a lot, of, uh, a lot of hope here, here recently because they also, uh, I forget who it was, one of them picked up Wheel of Time. Yep. Which is what, like 19 books? Mm -hmm. uh, 1,000 page books yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and the three at the yeah. end were not shorter even though that new dude took over so yeah it gives yeah. me hope with a long series like uh like magic machinery which is planned at 13 books right now that it's only a matter of time i'm holding out hope i'm looking at you netflix who i'm sure is watching right now they, they are only right? it's 
Yeah. If only it's slightly better than Shinara. <laughs> or Mythica. <laughs> so, well, so John. Simon, Simon makes it to the end. That's uh, to book 13. That's all I'm hoping for. Right? Jeez. <laughs> well, yeah, with his lip. <laughs> he just dies of cirrhosis. What a way to go. Like, anticlimactic as I'll get out. He just, oh, uh, he's well, sick. we said, let's let's turn these tropes on their heads. So, you know, who expects your main character to die, to die of, like, you know, disease? He just passes away peacefully one night. Yeah. Oh, great story. Great story. The end. The end. <laughs> I, I actually have a lot of hope that Martin is going to finish the books and he's got the big advantage of no matter what he does, it's going to be better than how they finished the series. Yeah. Well, did you, oh, uh, my, my favorite one right now is that it's the last book is just going to be the white walkers win in the first chapter. And the whole rest of the book is him just describing how cold it is. Winter in the last book is just called winter comes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Winter, winter is here winter, winter. it's really 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 cold <laughs> very 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 winter. very cold <laughs> and john here's a question for you why do you think that so many authors drop the ball when closing out a series god that's a tough question mm -hmm. um i think it's because part of it. the the expectation from readers is that it becomes the climax builds with every book. And so the scale has to, has to grow as well. I mean, uh, Lord of the Rings is a prime example. You start off with them being attacked by wraiths and you end with the battle of Helm's deep, which mm -hmm. when, when you're trying to look at that scope, it's hard. It, it's hard to build something that's going to be that epic at the end um, without making it just so heavy handed. And I think that's part of one of the biggest problems is that is that when you try to make it so big, and and D and D is a prime example. I mean, when you build modules, that last adventure is supposed to be fighting something huge and epic and massive. And how do you do that without it just you know jumping the shark? I guess would be the best phrase to describe it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that is. I I, I think most people. I think you could boil it down to simply saying it's way easier to ask questions and propose mysteries than it is to provide answers and reveal secrets. Because in most cases, the secret is not that fucking interesting. It's really interesting when you don't know what it is. It's really interesting when you don't know that Jack the Ripper is just a man who is psychotic and he's pretty yeah. good at hiding and killing people. And you think it really is some demon named spring -Heeled Jack and he's all over London. But as soon as it kind of becomes a guy, you're like, well, okay. Now well, I'm imagining think, back at that last, time when people were very superstitious, you know, suddenly right. the payoff is just not there. I think, I think the last season of Game of Thrones is a prime example because a lot of people complain that there were, there were story threads that were never tied up by the time you concluded the series. But that's the point, is that if you're going to do something that epic and that big, by the time you conclude it, you have to tie up all of the loose ends. And sometimes it's just too neat of a package and the ending falls short because you're spending the last book just closing out all these story arcs. Or you have characters that just have the balls to turn right to the camera when something peters out and says, sometimes life just ends with a fucking whimper, man. Sorry. You know, no, and tells I, another character that so that that they're off the hook for providing that climax. Like you don't need I, to because I actually like to go the Jimmy route and uh, just go ahead and kill everyone. <laughs> that way, all the storylines are done. Everyone's dead, That's and then we just describe the cold character. Why are you role playing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This story is really great. Oh, you're dead. Now done for the whole show. Oh, yeah, Jimmy. Kidd. Yeah, so. I, the the it, it's tricky i think uh the the matrix movies are another prime example you know just yeah they asked all the questions they should have just stopped but, but then mean, they came along with the answers and they were very uh you know they weren't the payoff well and the, but the problem is that that every reader can write it better right. every reader that's ever concluded a series would be like that's not how i would have done it and that's difficult as a writer because you can't do it better because I, I wrote it. So I wrote it exactly the way it should be.
but that's why fanfic became so popular so quickly was because there were so many people that were like, I could write a better ending. And everyone's like, well, then F and do it. And they're like, well, mm-hmm. okay, I guess it will. I guess I will. And then Wattpad was born. Yep. <laughs> and what'd you say? Wattpad. Oh. Wattpad is very popular with uh, girls the age of my daughter. It's a fanfic writing site. It's pretty terrible. That's all I need to know. You can stop. Yeah. <laughs> you lost me at My Little Pony. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Although apparently now I have to. John said I have to push my boundaries. So the My Little Pony adventure is coming. Listen, I'm just saying, combine what you know with something new. So My Little Cthulhu is a perfectly good story. That's what I'm writing. You stay off my turf, Berg. <laughs> I'm writing My Little Cthulhu, My Little Tentacle. I'll give it away on the channel. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that uh, I'm pretty sure that Brian will actually be able to search for that on Amazon. No, because my little tentacle sounds right up his alley. Oh, shots fired! Oh. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> I like this guy. So, okay, no that was an excellent discussion. I think I think we covered a lot of stuff, Brian. Uh, I. I am always excited to hear about people who produce things. Uh, ideas without execution are ideas. You know, they're not worthless, but they're the next thing to worthless. So uh, I, I'm always excited when I – I didn't even know you had published as much as you had, Brian, until about six months ago, and I really started looking. And uh, it, it's, it, it's impressive that people stick with it. you got to be disciplined. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm using this as just a little uh, pause point here. We're going to have a little station ID. Uh, we are Wizards of the Couch. I'm joined on the couch this week by uh, uh, Matt and Jimmy and Brian and our special guest, John messenger we've just been talking we've just been having a wonderful wide-ranging conversation about uh, writing and the writer's life what it means to go from little writer of my own thing that only i will digest or maybe my friends or my players and then advancing to like getting published and so on and so forth so uh definitely uh when we get this up on youtube check that out there's a lot of good tips there Uh, We're just going to take a few minutes right here. Uh, Matt is going to take it away for a minute here. We're going to have a question or two uh, from the couch. These are questions uh, we picked up on social media or on our Twitter feed, and I'm going to give it over to Matt. Yeah, so uh, also by uh, by the same token, if anybody in chat has any questions that they'd like to ask right now, that'd be great as well. But I have a couple that I'd like to pass to you fellas on – uh, basically gaming in general. So the first one that I picked up this week was experience points and leveling up. So are we, uh, what do you think about experience points? Kind of old school? Are we, uh, do you use benchmarks? How do you level up your players when you game? We'll start with, uh, with Jimmy. I am tr- liking and wanting to transition more to the pl- milestones over the XP. Uh, more and more seeing in the modules in the my gameplay, the characters are Murdo hoboing and they're trying to get the XP so they can get to the next level and they're missing points. They're missing story pieces. Uh, and so, um, I have the last dragon heist. The first one I ran, I mixed it. I actually was playing with that a little bit. Uh, and I'm beginning to favor more of the, the, um, milestones more than i am the xp i'm slowly being converted to that there you go yeah and i think there's there's definitely something to be said for what uh, something you just mentioned when you said the the murder hope style and uh, that's been kind of ingrained into the game we've been talking this entire episode about story driven content and how the um the game itself has uh, if you look back, uh, I've been slowly reaccumulating my collection of adventures over the last year or so. And uh, if you look back, at older, me. <laughs> oh yeah, by the way, that reminds me, I got one to outbid you on. Broke into Alex Cammer's basement. <laughs> <laughs> if um, if you look back at the older adventures, I mean, it is room to room. There's a monster, no story. There's four walls and an Otug. I know two gay. I know o, 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 o guy. Odiog. 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 Oh, I love how you guys say it with such authority, like there's some sort of pronunciation guide. So Odiog. Did you get one? It's right there in the name. O T U G. 
Sahawagan. How do you say that? Sahawagan. <laughs> fish guy. Sahawagan. Sahawagan. <laughs> There's a fish guy in the middle of the room, and you go attack him. But anyway, so but uh, over the especially with the resurgence in RPGs, it, it has dramatically changed to more story-driven content. So yeah, uh, it seems to me that the the old school XP method has kind of uh, uh, died off. Not died off. It's just become um, it's it's not relevant to the way that RPGs are run today. Brian, mm-hmm. uh, actually, John, what do you think? Uh, so I've always been a big fan of the experience version. Um, but the way we've always played was that you gain experience by completing a task. And it's not necessarily combat. I mean, uh, uh, Danny and I were actually talking about not too long ago about the 4E version of the skill, uh, skill challenges, um, where there's ways to accomplish a task that don't involve being a murder hobo. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, what we found so far as we've been running through the uh, the play tests for the Magic Machinery modules is that everyone wants to be a murder hobo. It doesn't matter that we tell them, like, you're an investigator, like, go investigate. <laughs> They're like, but what if I burn the entire town down? <laughs> 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 That'll certainly get the bad guys, right? It's collateral damage. It's fine. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of the that's kind of the problem with it is is as much as I like the experience version. Um, yeah, people do fixate on the idea that it's a CR monster, and if I kill it all, if I kill everything, you know, I think the running joke with every party that I've ever played with the experience version is one of your players dies, and you're like, ah, oh, but how much experience is he worth? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And uh, let's make sure we get his magic items. Oh well, yeah, we got to roll the body. Right. <laughs> all right, Brian. What do you think? If if you've ever read any of my modules. You know that I don't believe in challenge ratings. I absolutely 100% believe story better than rules every single time. Okay. Which is so third level adventures. Yeah, I got it. Right. (laughs) No, I wouldn't do that. Uh, But I I strongly dislike XP. Um, To me, it is math in an already mathy game. And the more math I have to do, that's the less story that I can tell. Um, I strongly believe in the game master having an easier time instead of a harder time. And so for me, I like to give my players rewards based on the things that I want to see them doing, like role playing, like solving puzzles, um, accomplishing quests, uh, you know, progressing the story. That's when I hand out XP. Um, And I don't even really even give numerical values to it. I might say, okay, here you you gain two points or something, and by the time I get to ten points, boom, you've leveled up, right? Um, so I, I, my XP is completely different than that with, that's within the book, uh, because I want to reward players for the behavior that I want to see in my story. Yeah, that's great, and I think I really um, like I was alluding to earlier. I think that that's the way that it's really moving to the, even the most recent published editions of D and D Pathfinder example, they all still have those XP tables, but I mm-hmm. truly get the feeling that not many people are are really using those. It's more just exactly like you described, go do these go do XYZ tasks and once you're there, then we've accomplished a level. My my uh, dungeon master right now for even our Pathfinder campaign is exactly that same way. It's we reached this point. Go ahead mm-hmm. and level up. It's not we don't calculate XP at all. It's not even on our character sheets. You know, the campaign we're, that we're running right now actually uh, does something similar where it's, it's, you know, you gain AP based off the things that you're actually accomplishing. Um, but one of the things that I really like is we only play once every couple of weeks. And in between, if you do journal entries based off what your character is experiencing mm-hmm. or you do, you interact because we have a, a obsidian mm-hmm. portal that we use as a, as a, as a, as a uh, reference. Um, if you interact with other characters while you're camping that night in between the adventures, um, and it helps to drive the story forward. You can get points for that as well. And I think that really helps, number one, get into your character more, but also kind of advances the storyline even when we're not role-playing, we're not sitting around the table. So as a published author, your character is a little bit higher level than everyone else? Is that how that works? <laughs> you know, I, legitimately, I sometimes feel shamed by some of the journal entries I read from the other players. Like That's these guys, awesome. if they ever sat down and actually decided to write novels, um, they would break the one cardinal rule, which is don't be better than me. 
Right. Nice. Right. So right. I don't think I have any. I just want to take just a second to uh, acknowledge some of our um, supporters who are out there. <laughs> And uh, are both online, Beth. I will uh, join you. I will join you, Matt. I'm trying to work a shirt from her. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so there you go. Oh, look at there. There you go. That is awesome. Where'd, Where'd you get that? That's fantastic. <laughs> this, is my, this, is my cu- this is my cucumber hulk. Cucumber hulk. That's awesome. It's got its little, cu- it's got its little cucumber knobs. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. All right. Uh, I don't so know Beth, you guys anymore. Uh, Beth in Penny Arcade is going to be in uh, booth 1249. Beth uh, is the CFO for Penny Arcade. And uh, Anna Meyer, what booth are you going to be in? Are you going to be in a booth or are you just going to be walking around? I thought she was Wolves. Both of those are supporters of the show. And uh, we really appreciate you uh, being our patrons and helping us out. Uh, 437, Anna says. So booth 437, if you're at Jim. probably the Hero Lab. That's what I thought. Right. She said she, really she, you were going to be with her. She we thought, but you you can't make it now. Oh, that's so, right. Yeah. Brian, Brian, yeah, poor Brian. That's Danny good. and Jimmy will both be at Gen Con this Unbelievable. week. Unbelievable. John, John, you're not going, right? Taking the walk. No, not this year, but I'm going to try for next year. Yeah, yep. we're going to talk him into it. We can see you at uh, Denver, whatever they're calling themselves now. So Denver's past this year. I will be at, uh, I'll be at New York Comic Con in October. Ooh, New York Comic Con. Yeah, great. That's awesome. That's all I got, Danny. Cool. So are we through questions on the couch and we're done with That's Patreon? Done. I got I got one more. I got one more. So Go. uh, hang around for last call. As soon as we uh, close up the show and let uh, John get back to his real life, uh, we will have last call where we're going to discuss uh, things you can do as a dungeon master to make your encounters, uh, your non-combat encounters more exciting. Mm. Now and Okay, cool. So, yet another episode of Wizard of the Couch in the Can. The four of us tonight, uh, Jimmy, Matt, Brian, me, Danny, we're here in the house with John Messenger. We got all sorts of great uh, tips and information about how to engage with stories, how to write, how to sit down and get it done every day and not uh, take any guff from that part of you that tells you, I don't have time for it, man. I'd rather eat some Doritos, rather play some Breath of the Wild, which is exactly what I'm going to do after this show. So uh, we are going to be at Gen Con uh, here in another day or two. Uh, Please follow the Wizards accounts on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, Also follow my account, Danny Lee Grime, because sometimes I won't know which one I'm posting to, so look at all of them. And we will be doing – Blackwood uh, Society stuff on Thursday and Friday. Uh, we're going to be doing Call of Cthulhu on Saturday, Friday and Saturday. We're going to be doing a pop-up game of our Not a Nautiloid uh, spaceships, which I have one right here. Oh my God! The Dead Knot. Mm. Mm. So mm. we're going to be doing all that at Gen Con. Please follow us and uh, get us get the word out there. Like, share, subscribe, do all of it. We love you. Thank you for joining us tonight. And stick around for Last Call afterwards uh, where we're going to be talking about cool, interesting stuff. Peace. Thanks.